Good evening. I think I must begin uh, by saying something very briefly about these widely circulated reports of the discovery of millions of planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy. Well, I'm sorry, um, that is premature to say the least. Very delicate investigations indicate that many stars may be accompanied by invisible bodies, which may be planets, they may equally well be very lightweight stars of the kind known as brown dwarfs. At the present, we don't know. No doubt we'll find out in the future. Meanwhile, uh, please treat these sensational reports with a very large grain of cosmic salt. And now, on to our main program. We can see the stars. We can see the other star systems or galaxies, if you know where to look. But what about the space between the stars? Is it empty? Well, we used to think so, but we know better now. And this is where I'm delighted to introduce once more the director of the Royal Greenwich Observatory, Professor Alec Boxenberg. And this is a very good time because, Alec, you've just had a minor planet named in your honor. So asteroid number 3205 is now known officially as Boxenberg. And many congratulations on that. Thank you. First of all, um, we do know that space is by no means empty. That's right. Although space has an amount of gas which is, generally speaking in density terms, much less than you'd find in the best vacuum in the laboratory, there's nevertheless a lot of gas in the galaxy. The average density is about one atom per cubic centimeter, and the total amount of mass involved is something like a tenth of the total mass of the galaxy. So there's quite a lot of, lot of gas. But obviously, we can't see it directly, so people are going to say, well, how do we know it's there at all? Well, to understand this, let's first look at the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum extends from gamma rays in the very short wavelength end right through to the radio at the long wavelength end. Uh, somewhere in the middle is the optical region, and most of the work we uh, do in astronomy from the ground is in that region. Yes. In the case of uh, stellar spectra, we, we, can, we, we, we know that stars uh, exist over a range of temperatures. Some are very hot, some are very cool, but they all have their own spectral signatures. The star Delta Orionis, uh, one of these, rather hot, has uh, a spectrum which has a continuum, uh, that is all the colors which go continuously from uh, violet to, to red, and also superimposed on that uh, some absorption lines. And generally speaking, such absorption lines in, in, in the spectra of stars are absolutely stationary. Now, in this particular object, uh, it was noticed that they were moving. They moved uh, one way, then the other, blue shifted and red shifted uh, through the Doppler effect, uh, indicating that the star that we saw was part of a binary system. Uh, the other one, uh, its companion, was rather fainter, and we, didn't, uh, we could not see uh, any evidence, ev evidence of that. But as uh, they orbit each other, then the brighter one that we can see, that's the one we call Delta Orionis in general, has uh, its spectrum uh, shifts because the star's approaching us and then receding, and the Doppler effect produces, th produces this effect. In the spectrum of Delta Orionis, uh, Johann Hartmann in 1904 noticed not only were the lines moving, those lines due to the star itself, uh, but there were some, also some stationary lines. These were sharp lines which could not be associated with that binary system, therefore, but must have been in the line of sight to the bright star. In fact, it was the first evidence of interstellar material. So there's gas between the stars, but there's also a certain amount of what we normally call dust. But what exactly is it? Yes, there is a small proportion of dust uh, made up of heavy elements, actually. Uh, there's something like one dust grain per 100 billion cubic centimeters, compared with about one atom per, hundred, per, per uh, cubic centimeter, per one cubic centimeter in the interstellar material. Now, this dust is uh, seen because of its reddening effect. The general uh, effect of the dust is to reduce the amount of light, to obscure the light from stars, uh, but at the same time change its color. It's just the same as on the Earth, when we see the sun near the sunset. Uh, the sun we know is yellowish when it's high up in the sky, but when it goes down low, then the dust and water particles in the atmosphere obscure some of it and redden it. In fact, they're not really reddening it. They're cutting out the blue. And of course, we do see the same effect with very distant stars when their light comes to us through a certain amount of dust. Yes, this is uh, more or less um, effective according to the density of the cloud. Uh, some clouds are very dense indeed, so dense, in fact, that 
almost all of the light is obscured, uh, at least uh, all of the optical light. You can still see through them in the infrared and the radio region, but uh, all of the op optical light is obscured. And some of the most dense regions uh, are called um, Bock globules. These may have um, a total mass of something like 100 suns, uh, but uh, are very small and therefore very dense. And most of the light that uh, comes to us from the galaxy is obscured. That is, all the stars behind the cloud uh, are, are not seen. Some stars are seen, but these are the ones in front of the cloud. We also have what are termed reflection nebulae. Yes, reflection nebulae are, um, again, very dense gas clouds containing dust. Uh, with stars nearby, the starlight reflects off the dust in the cloud as if it were a screen. The uh, best example, perhaps, is and the most stunning example, is the Rho of Yuki cloud, uh, which has a lot of um, dense gaseous regions with dust and many stars. And this uh, shows the colors, both of the stars and the fact that the dust reflects more efficiently in the blue. So there's a bluing effect, but uh, there's a whole range of colors. It's quite a stunning uh, region. It is indeed when you photograph it, but I think the nebula that most people are going to know is of course the famous Messier 42 in the Sword of Orion because you can see that with the naked eye, but that's not quite the same thing. It's not quite the same thing in the way it appears to us, but it's almost the same thing uh, in principle. What's happening here is in the foreground uh, of a very massive cloud, most of which can't be seen, uh, is a group of very hot stars which have been recently formed. The the trapezium stars, uh, which are so hot that they ionize the gas in the, at the edge of this very large cloud. That is, they remove the electron from the hydrogen uh, atoms, uh, and these free electrons eventually recombine with uh, the nuclei of other hydrogen atoms, and in the cascade process that results, uh, several strong emission lines of hydrogen are produced. The uh, sequence goes from red to blue uh, and, to the, uh, and, and, in fact, to the ultraviolet. Uh, but the strongest line in that sequence is the red line. And that gives the characteristic red appearance of the Orion Nebula. In fact, this is only a very small part of the total cloud. And it's a cavity in the cloud. The, the uh, trapezium stars have, in a sense, burnt this cavity in the cloud. And you can imagine it um, as if it were a a bite out of an apple. We're seeing the bite, and that is the Orion Nebula. Because the Orion Nebula itself is only a very small part of a very much larger cloud that we can't see in the same way. We can only see that very large cloud through uh, radio or um, um, uh, infrared uh, observations, mostly radio, uh, and many molecular lines are seen. It is, in fact, a very dense region, just like the um, other dense regions which show reflection nebulae. There's no real difference in the basis of these but uh, only in the way that they're illuminated. Well, so we come to the dark nebulae, and of course, I'm always fascinated by the famous horse's head and Orion, which is not all that difficult to photograph, but very difficult indeed to see visually, as I've always found. Uh, even so, in the photograph, uh, there's no doubt at all that there's a lot of interstellar material here. The horse head, again, is a dense region, uh, not many stars nearby, so it just obscures the stars behind, but it's also obscuring a very diffuse emission nebula that's seen by the red color. The horse head also is only a, pr a protuberance from a much larger dark cloud uh, at the lower part of the picture. And uh, in that cloud and just in front of it, there's a very bright star. And you can see that uh, just at the bottom there as a reflection nebula, in fact. Well, hydrogen plays a very important part in all this. And of course, hydrogen is more abundant than any other element in the universe. And it's by the clouds of cold hydrogen in our galaxy that we've been able to map the shape of the actual galaxy itself, even though we live inside it. These clouds of hydrogen radiate at a wavelength of 21 centimeters. Well, of course, you can't see that. It's in the radio range. But we can detect it. We can find out how these clouds of hydrogen are moving. We can find out where they are. And from that, we found out that our galaxy, our Milky Way system, is in fact a spiral, rather like a huge Catherine wheel, with the sun something like 30,000 light years away from the center. If we could see our galaxy at a greater angle, it would appear something like this. And if we could see it edge on, then it would appear 
rather like the shape of two fried eggs clapped together back to back with a line of absorbing material running right along the center. And in fact, observations from the IRS infrared astronomical satellite have shown that our Milky Way has the same kind of appearance. Yes, we're seeing this from the inside, so to speak. Uh, the gas um, is quite dense, quite close to the plane. There's a lot of dust there. And the IRA satellite observing in the far infrared can see the dust glowing due to its own relatively high temperature, but that's still rather low, I must say. It's, it's uh, the thermal emission that we're seeing here and also the emission from molecular clouds. And that's very well confined, maybe within 100 to 150 parsecs of the plane of the galaxy. What exactly is the origin of this interstellar material? Well, that is a very, perhaps the most interesting question of all. Uh, just soon after the Big Bang, the gas that existed uh, was consisted only of the light elements, hydrogen, helium, deuterium, and so on. None of the heavy elements existed then at all. And how long ago was that? About 15 billion years ago. That was the time of the Big Bang. The uh, gas that, uh, the primordial gas that then existed, uh, um, as the universe expanded, somehow began collapsing into galaxies. We don't exactly know how this happened, but clearly it has happened. As it did so, stars were formed, and eventually these stars cooked these elements in their cores, uh, forming heavy elements through the process of nucleosynthesis. As time went by, uh, some stars ejected some of this material, more or less gently. Uh, the more gentle ones can produce uh, envelopes around them, the planetary nebulae, of which the nebula in Lyra is the best example. I remember that photograph very well. It was actually taken during a Sky at Night program in the very early days of the Isaac Newton telescope on La Palma. I think it's probably one of the best pictures of it I've seen. And that, of course, is the fate of a star like the Sun. It will eventually create a planetary nebula and then turn into a white dwarf. But stars which are very much more massive will have a much more violent fate. They will turn into supernovae. And we've heard um, a great deal about supernovae recently. It's the one we've been hearing so much about is the one that went off in the Large Magellanic Cloud last year called Supernova 1987A. Uh, recently, this has been showing quite a remarkable effect called a light echo, uh, which comes from screens, basically interstellar material containing dust, uh, in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which bounce the light from the supernova uh, around a longer path uh, than the light coming direct from it, so that we're seeing the earlier phase reflected. Uh, and these appear as uh, rings. In fact, there's two such clouds, so there's two rings. I suppose the most famous of all supernova remnants is the, the Crab Nebula, the remnant of the star seen in 1054. Yeah, this is an, obviously an older one, and, and you can see that quite violent activity has occurred. The gas has been ejected from the supernova, uh, and it's very turbulent, and it's, it's uh, clearly going out into the, into, into the interstellar medium. Uh, the Vela pulsar, which is uh, an older one still, this is about 10,000 years old, uh, is now very extensive, and it's quite clear that the original gas that the star has cooked, and uh, in fact, it, during the process of the supernova event, even more heavy elements are produced, all of these have been injected very widely into the interstellar medium. You know, when we're talking about the evolution of stars and the evolution of galaxies, the role of supernovae is all important. It's uh, all important in several ways. One of the most important ways is that, as we've just seen, it, uh, they enrich the interstellar medium uh, with heavy elements. Uh, and then what happens is the uh, gas uh, existing at large in the galaxy, which is both stirred by the uh, supernova, the shock of it, and also enriched by it, can produce new stars. Uh, the gas collapses and uh, many cycles like this might occur. The Pleiades is a very good example of a recent one. Uh, the new stars here uh, have just perhaps been formed about a million years ago or so, and you can still see some of the gas which is left over from their formation. How dense is the interstellar material? Well, there's a, a very wide range, range of densities. In the dark clouds, it may be up to 10,000 atoms per cubic centimeter or molecules, uh, but around supernovae, it's very much uh, more tenuous. In fact, there may be one atom per thousand cubic centimeters. In the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud, there's um, uh, a supernova remnant showing it in the form of a bubble. Uh, this might be um, perhaps 100 parsecs across eventually, but 
very uh, little gas in terms of density, but also very hot. It may be, say, a million degrees Kelvin. So the interstellar medium is really a kind of foam. Yes, a, a vast uh, high temperature soapy foam. Uh, the gas uh, that, that, that produces these bubbles uh, you can regard as being produced in a sort of a bomb burst. The uh, supernova uh, ejects material violently and produces a sort of cavity which is very hot, very tenuous. Uh, this can happen in the body of the galaxy, but also near the edge where the gas uh, boundary comes, if, if such a supernova occurs, then the material is ejected very violently into the much lower density material beyond and eventually can produce a very large halo, a, a corona, if you like, to the whole galaxy. We've been talking about heat, and of course people are going to say, well, if this material is so hot, why aren't we all boiled alive? And I think it's important to make clear here that there's a definite difference between the scientific definition of temperature and what we normally call heat. And I think to show that, let's have a look first at a firework sparkler. Now, every one of those sparks is at a very high temperature. You can say it's white hot if you like, but each spark has such little mass that there's almost no heat there, and you can very safely hold the firework in your hand. Now consider a red hot poker. The actual temperature is very much lower, because red heat isn't as hot as white heat, but the mass is much greater, and I would simply hate to hold that poker in my hand. So temperature and heat are not quite the same thing. It's fair to say, isn't it also, that um, the universe, the galaxy, is in a state of flux. Yes, it couldn't be more uh, disrupted. The supernova, of course, are the ones uh, are what do this. Uh, everywhere you are, there's been a supernova explosion at some time or other, and maybe in um, one or two million years, wherever you are in the galaxy, you'll experience a blast wave from a supernova. And we won't feel it. <laughs> well, now let's turn to other galaxies. There are plenty of those, and one is very nicely on view now, the famous Andromeda galaxy, just visible with the naked eye, not very far away from the square of Pegasus. And when photographed with a large telescope, it looks like this. It's a spiral, almost edgewise onto us, and larger than our own galaxy. It's over two million light years away. And there are plenty of other galaxies. And what about the material in them? Well, they're very much like uh, the material in our own galaxy. There's different types of galaxies, but broadly speaking, this is true. Uh, you can see both the gas and the dust. Uh, a very good example of dust is, is the, in the great dust lane in Centaurus A. Well, Centaurus A is fairly close as galaxies go. Yes, this and uh, other galaxies that we see uh, gas in uh, are, are very close indeed. But in the spectra of quasars, we see evidence of very much more distant galaxies. But if we follow the conventional view, quasars are superluminous and extremely remote, I mean, thousands of millions of light years. Yes, they look like stars, but they're at the very, almost at the very observable, very edge of the observable universe. Uh, the light from them has taken almost the entire age of the, of the universe to get to us. But in the process, has passed through uh, gas uh, in galaxies and, uh, for that matter, intergalactic gas that we can observe in their spectra. So there's material between the galaxies as well as between the stars? Yes, the spectrum of a quasar, which uh, generally speaking in the high redshift cases shows a very strong emission line due to hydrogen, redshifted into the visible region, also shows absorption lines which have characteristics of heavy elements, uh, in fact uh, usually carbon is seen, uh, and this shows that there are galaxies which have produced heavy elements through star formation a long time ago, uh, and also hydrogen lines, which show as a, as a sort of very thick forest of absorption lines. Uh, and this is coming from gas which hasn't yet formed into galaxies. It, in fact, it's gas between galaxies, intergalactic material. What's the density of this intergalactic material? And could you describe it as being, well, clumpy? The material is very much less dense than the gas in the galaxies. Uh, and it is very clumpy. Uh, if we look at the line of sight to a quasar, uh, which might be almost at the observable edge of the universe, then the gas near it that we see in the line of sight, it's the dot on the left of the picture, uh, the gas near it is um, much more dense in ter terms of numbers of clouds than it is locally to us, because we can see a sort of evolution that has occurred. There's much more intergalactic material unformed into galaxies uh, than galaxies in the early period than there is now when there's a lot less uh, intergalactic material but, but more galaxies. Well, we've learned a great deal during the last few years. And who knows, perhaps the Hubble Space Telescope 
The 94-inch reflector, due to be launched very soon, will tell us more. I hope it does. Meanwhile, we've certainly learned that what we used to regard as empty space is anything but empty. Alec, thank you very much. And from both of us, good night.